Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending where you are based. And welcome to this webinar on shaping the future of public health sustainable investment. My name is Marta Lamazzi. I'm the executive manager of the World Federation of Public Health Association. And I'm really pleased to co-chair this webinar together with Dr. Michael Moore, chair of the International Immunization Policy Task Force of the World Federation of Public Health Association. Today, we will discuss the return on investment of immunization, as well as the need to make sustainable investment on immunization to save millions of lives and more and more in the years to come. Mm. We will specifically focus today on two key examples. The first one is HPV vaccination and discuss the return on investment of this vaccination, both in terms of human life, as well as financial return on investment. Moreover, we will get an insight about the development of the health system and immunization system of Costa Rica and how successful it has been in protecting the population. That said, it is my great honor to introduce our speaker of today. The first one is Dr. Anuradha Gupta. Anuradha is the president of Global Immunization at Sabin Vaccine Institute. A veteran public health leader, she has led successfully a plethora of activities at the global level to improve the health of women, children, and harness the full power of vaccine. Prior to her activities at Sabin, she was the deputy CEO at Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, as well as mission director of the National Health Mission of India. Anuradha holds a Master of Business Administration from the University of Wollongong in Australia and received executive education from the Harvard University, the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. Anuradha is a real honor to have you speaking and sharing your big experience and knowledge with all of us. And I'm sure that your words will inspire the public health professional and senior uh, bureaucrats and policymakers, and also the young generation in public health, how to do well in public health and how to make sure that immunization program will be even stronger in the years to come. Anuradha, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Marta, and um, um, so glad to have this opportunity to address uh, uh, public health professionals. And uh, the subject that I'm going to speak about today is so close to my heart, which is really uh, the human papilloma virus, its devastating uh, effects, uh, particularly on women uh, or who are uh, dying of cervical cancer, uh, uh, every day. In fact, uh, a woman's life is claimed by cervical cancer every 90 uh, seconds. Uh, we have uh, seen a very worrying increase in, in the number of uh, uh, new HPV infections, which have now risen to 600,000 uh, new cases every year, and with a very high fatality rate with 340,000 deaths uh, uh, due to cervical cancer. And what is extremely disturbing is the fact that uh, incidence of cervical cancer is rising, uh, is not going down. It is rising among young women of 15 to 49, years of age. Uh, as I said, you know, a couple of years ago, we used to say we lose a woman to cervical cancer every two minutes. Now, now cervical cancer is killing a woman every 90 seconds. And, and actually, if we don't take action today, then there will be a further 50% increase in the number of uh, uh, deaths caused by cervical cancer, which means a woman is at risk of dying every 60 seconds in the years to come. And each death is a tragedy that can be uh, averted. 
Um, when you look at the cervical cancer landscape, uh, you also see that the burden of this disease and the deaths are very unequal. And it is low income countries and really poor families within low income countries that, that suffer from a disproportionate burden of this disease. So here this, uh, this graph will show you that low income countries have a three times higher incidence of cervical cancer compared to high income uh, countries. But if you look at the death rates, the mortality rates, yeah, you, you see here that deaths in low income countries are eight times higher uh, compared to high income countries. So look at the, that, the, the high toll that cervical cancer is taking in low income countries you, where uh, fatality rates because of um, cervical cancer are exceptionally high and that just shows lack of access uh, to preventive tools including primary and secondary prevention. Women uh, uh, living with HIV are uh, at a particularly high risk of uh, HPV prevalence uh, and also at six times higher risk of developing cervical cancer during their lifetime. So really important to understand that, that the risk of cervical cancer is not equally distributed uh, within populations. And there are um, certain groups that, that have a much, much higher risk of, of uh, developing and then dying of cervical cancer. Next. Uh, we have fortunately an increasing set of tools uh, to prevent HPV cervical cancer. And we know that uh, um, cervical cancer can actually be eliminated if, if we gather our act. And, and this uh, set of tools includes vaccines, highly effective vaccines, uh, diagnostic tests, which are becoming much more advanced and simpler to use. And, and women can now do self-sampling and, and also a new treatment methods that can treat precancerous lesions before they develop into uh, full-blown cervical cancer. Next. However, uh, the, the uptake of these preventative tools uh, unfortunately remains a very uh, lackluster and low. So HPV vaccine was introduced 14 years ago, but you can see here that uh, HPV vaccine uh, coverage rates remain very low globally, with only one in seven eligible girls having received HPV vaccination in 20. Uh, 22 and countries that that account for nearly 60 percent of cervical cancer burden are yet to introduce uh, the HPV vaccine in the national immunization programs. Uh, if we uh, look at the screening data, we find a lot of gaps. So the data is uh, inadequate. It is also very patchy. But but whatever we could glean shows that. Uh, uh, less than 50%, in fact, about 44% of women in low middle income countries have ever been screened for cervical cancer, uh, as opposed to a WHO recommendation that recommends at least twice uh, uh, screening, at least twice uh, during, during the life course of a woman. Next. It is also important to understand that uh, when a woman is diagnosed uh, with cervical cancer, it is very difficult um, for, for, for her to actually bear the expenses of treatment. First, a lot of LMICs do not have adequate uh, treatment facilities, but then the costs can be prohibitively high for, for families who can ill afford uh, that, that expensive treatment. Also treatment methods for cervical cancer have remained very archaic and primitive and extremely traumatic you know, for women who undergo this, this, this treatment. And, and therefore the emotional uh, cause uh, of, of the trauma that is caused to women themselves, but also to the families is, is really very high, is high, but very difficult to measure. Next. We do have data which suggests that if we don't um, act today, uh, the global economy stands to lose $28 uh, billion uh, by 2030. So it's not just a moral imperative uh, and it's not just a women health issue, 
to, to um, invest in HPV prevention and cervical cancer elimination, but there's also an economic argument for stepped up investments in, in uh, HPV prevention and cervical cancer elimination. Next, uh, there is a very, uh, there is a recent report that's just been released at Davos um, by the World Economic Forum, uh, which, which uh, uh, brings out how uh, one dollar, every one dollar invested in women's health actually delivers a return of three dollars uh, in, in economic uh, growth. So really a sensible uh, agenda to pursue. Next. Uh, actually, uh, 2020 was the first time uh, that the world united uh, to, to um, make a clarion call to eliminate uh, a cancer. So we know that uh, families are increasingly uh, facing the pressure of, of uh, different kinds of cancers. But here is a cancer, cervical cancer is the type of cancer that, as I said, uh, can not just be prevented, but it is uh, it can be eliminated. And therefore, it was very heartening to see WHO um, uh, taking leadership on bringing member states together to commit uh, to eliminating cervical cancer. Next. Uh, following this call, uh, the Sabin um, uh, uh, Vaccine Institute actually took a lead to, to galvanize a very diverse set of partners uh, to, to launch uh, the Global HPV uh, Consortium on 5th of September to, uh, 2023. That means a, month, a few months uh, ago in Kuala Lumpur, uh, Malaysia. And we were so happy to see the enormous response uh, to the launch uh, of, of, of the consortium where, where several countries uh, participated and expressed a desire uh, to, to, uh, to uh, collaborate uh, with, with uh, an initiative to eliminate cervical cancer, but also multilateral organizations coming together to, to commit uh, their support. Next. Uh, what um, uh, now the uh, Global HPV Consortium uh, has launched uh, its uh, strategy and action plan for the next uh, three years. Uh, and, and the key strategic priority areas really focus on global advocacy and thought uh, uh, partnership, uh, knowledge management uh, and exchange. Uh, so we know there are lots of evidence gaps, but also there is very useful, valuable evidence and knowledge being generated, uh, which, which, but it is important to disseminate that and share that uh, with, uh, with all the st stakeholders. The consortium is also committed to convening uh, key stakeholders uh, and, and also make sure that countries receive support uh, to develop and implement a comprehensive and holistic uh, cervical cancer elimination plans that bring together uh, pre, uh, pre, uh, second, uh, primary and secondary prevention together, which means all the three pillars uh, that are important to eliminate cervical cancer and include vaccination, uh, timely screening, uh, so that uh, cervical cancer can be detected early, but also treatment uh, for, for pre-cancer lesions. Uh, next. Uh, I'm very glad to share this slide uh, because um, uh, within uh, weeks and months of uh, the launch of the consortium, uh, we have seen the number of consortium partners growing. So the consortium now has 40 uh, uh, partners. And looking at this list, you can see how diverse they are. So we are truly a transdisciplinary alliance where diverse uh, uh, actors are bringing their own comparative advantage uh, to make sure that, that uh, uh, the whole is greater than the sum of its uh, parts. And, and the consortium remains committed uh, to activating uh, community-based um, voices uh, and particularly uh, unleash the power of uh, the youth and, and uh, women groups. This is also the first uh, initiative of its kind that is looking holistically at, at primary and secondary prevention and bringing that uh, together. Uh, and we are so proud that World Federation of Public Health Associations is a part uh, of this, uh, this consortium. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Marta. Uh, and uh, and thank you, uh, especially uh, uh, Arunal, for that uh, 
very insightful reflection on where we're at and uh, what our challenges, the challenges are in front of us. Uh, and for adding into it that hope that this is something that we are going to be able to deal with uh, as a uh, as a global community. Um, it's now my pleasure to uh, move to Costa Rica, where uh, Hugo Marine Pava is uh, is going to share with us his experience of uh, of and the Costa Rican uh, experience. Uh, Hugo is a medical doctor. He's a master in public health and a master in uh, health assessment and market access in pharma economy. Since 2011, he's worked with the pharma, pharmacoepidemiology area in the uh, Department of the Costa Rican Social Security Fund. Uh, and uh, since uh, 2000, sorry, he's been there uh, as head since 2019 and been involved with it since 2012. He was a member of the National Vaccines and Epidemiology Commission from January 2018 to August 2022, represented as a representative of the Pharmacoepidemiology Department uh, and uh, the Costa Rican Social Security uh, yeah. Fund. Um, he, between 2020 and May 2022, he was part of the uh, Interinstitutional Coordination Task Force the acquisition of COVID-19 vaccines for Costa Rican government. And uh, and he's now going to present on the impact that uh, a country can have when you take a long-term investment approach. Uh, Hugo. Hi, thank you. It's very my pleasure to be here. And I really appreciate this opportunity to share a little of my experience and the experience of a country, a whole country, as is Costa Rica, in procuring a long-term uh, vaccine, successful vaccine uh, or immunization program, and how it has been a, a good return of this investment. Uh, to put it in context, Costa Rica is a small country. As you can see here, it's very, very small. We have 51,000 square kilometers and around 5 million people, a little more than 5 million people. Uh, we are located in Central America between the Pacific Ocean and the Caribbean Sea. We have an economy that was based until late the 20th century, even the 90s, uh, on agriculture and very basic manufacture. And since the 1990s, this, we have had a, a, an important shift in that economy to specialize manufacturer services, including uh, the investigation and development of microchips and other computer parts, and now also in medical devices, services, uh, mainly outsourcing of services uh, from abroad, tourism, and uh, also agriculture that continues to be an important uh, source of revenue for the country. Uh, I, I am not willing to give a lecture on Costa Rica's history, but it's very important to put into place the accomplishments of or our achievements in this country, mainly in immunization, in the, the history and some events that occurred in the second part or the first part, sorry, of the 20th century, which in the 19, early 1940s, uh, with the promulgation of the social guarantees, which were a, so, a series of uh, progressive reform policies, seeking for the well-being of population. And it was very interesting because it involved a lot of people, but the three main leaders were the president of the Republic, which was a medical doctor by that time, Dr. Rafael Angel Calderón Guardia, the leader of the Communist Party, and also the leader of the Catholic Church, the Archbishop of San Jose. And it was very interesting, as I say, because uh, that shows the pluralism of the discussion that took place to put into agreement uh, and accomplish a social agreement that led to the creation of Caja Costarricense de Seguro Social, which is where I work, the social security system, also the University of Costa Rica, a, 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 an academical institution, and also the labor law, which is named as Código de Trabajo. It's not only one law, it's a group of laws that involve all the warranties for the people that 
the for mainly for the employees and also some uh, guarantees for the employers itself themselves. Then we had a revolution at the end of this decade, 1940s and 1948. But the end of that revolution, instead of being a another uh, dictatorship more in the Latin America area, uh, the group that win that won that war decided to abolish the army forces, and this took place on December first, nineteen forty-eight. This is a picture of the demolition of, which was a symbolic demolition of the main uh, headquarters of the army. And instead of investing in defense, Costa Rica has decided to invest in public infrastructure, education, environment, and other social determinants of health. So it was, has been an important issue for us. Uh, and that, that shaped the evolution in the 1950s and 1960s and 70s, which led to what we could accomplish as a society in Costa Rica. Uh, at least in the vaccination uh, in our, that we are speaking right now. Uh, to understand a little our health system, we have a Ministry of Health, which is only rector in the area of, of, of health, public health. Caja Costarricense Seguro Social, as I told, Caja is a main provider for, for health public services has a coverage of over 90%, it was around 92, 93%. The seven to 8% of people that are not covered are not rich people, are actually excluded people. And for a practical level, they get actually get some attention, some medical care, but are excluded from formal system. So it's a challenge that we have to, to get coverage uh, mainly that nice, 100% of people. We have private providers and interestingly, they mainly dedicate to the very, very rich people and also for some middle class that don't want to wait for a procedure or they want to choose a different treatment uh, and not go into the public service. And it accounts for around 20 to 30% of the the attentions that are given in the country, mainly low and middle complexity, no high complexity, which is mainly provided by CAHA. And there are other institutions involved directly or indirectly in public health that form part of our health system. Uh, and that includes uh, one institution that actually is important in the management of environmental health, which is the Instituto Nacional de Productos de Cantabillado, the sanitation and water supply system. And that is a centralized institution that supervises all the water suppliers in the country and also the disposal of the uh, residual waters and management of that. Uh, now, speaking a little of our immunization program, it's a public program. It's free access, regardless any condition. You don't, it could be a, an irregular immigrant in Costa Rica and you get access to vaccines. That's very important, regardless of also age. The vaccines are mandatory for minors and also for selective groups of interest. For example, some in some context for getting a work, a job, uh, if you are going to handle with some uh, ex exposed to, to some pathogens, you could be mandated to have vaccination. Uh, I, I am thinking about health workers, healthcare workers, which have to be vaccinated against hepatitis B and also against influenza and now COVID-19. Uh, our uh, immunization program is financed by CAHA and Ministry of Health mainly CAHA, the law says it has to be financed by both CAHA and Ministry of Health, uh, but the main financing is coming by CAHA. It's executed by CAHA at community level, and that includes uh, the work with communities and going to stick for the people and uh, establish vaccination facilities where people live. Uh, we have a very successful uh, vaccination in, at school level and also in other institutions like, for instance, the 
providers of care for uh, elderly and uh, people that live in vulnerable conditions and also in jails and other institutions will go out there and, and deliver the vaccines to the people. Uh, the immunization program Costa Rica is regulated by law. There is a national immunization law first published in 2001. We have over 20 years of having that law. And uh, that law creates the National Vaccination Epidemiology Commission, which I have had the privilege to be part for almost five years. Uh, that commission, the National Vaccination and Epidemiology Commission, is integrated by the Minister of Health or their representative, which is, which is the chair of the commission. Also, uh, some representative of the surveillance unit, health surveillance unit at the Ministry of Health. The Costa Rican Pediatricians Association, which is a private uh, association, but very strong academic association and has four persons from CAHA, which represent infectology department, the child and adolescent department, the National Children's Hospital, which is the main provider for children, mainly in high, uh, high technology interventions, uh, high complexity interventions. And also the pharmacotherapy department is, in, is interrace that commission, which I was part of that. Uh, the main functions established by law, uh, th those that I cite here are not the only functions, but which I think are the main functions are resumed here, which is to guarantee the mandatory and free nature of vaccines and effective access to them for the entire population, to formulate general political and strategic guidelines on vaccination, to approve manuals, educational materials, and immunization standards, and also to coordinate national vaccination programs on an ordinary basis and also extraordinarily when the National Commission for Risk and Prevention and Emergency Response, uh, when there is an emergency declared by this commission. This commission, I forgot to mention before, is what could be the equivalent of National Guard in some states, also Army Forces and others, and uh, it's civilian, completely civilian, but it's the one that gives response to emergency situations. Uh, is the one that, that goes and organizes also the preventive at, at, at community level to prevent and identify the risk. Uh, we are a seismic country, so we have often earthquakes and we are prepared and part of the preparation is taken by that commission, but also the emergency declared for COVID-19 was controlled was over or by the guidance of this commission. Uh, now I want to speak a little bit about the power revolving fund, which is the provider for main, the, the most of the vaccines that the Costa Rica and government acquires. It's important to mention that by law, this is the main source or this the main provider or the provider that should be uh, giving us the vaccines. Uh, only in cases that the revolving fund don't have a vaccine uh, and that which it would be needed in the immunization program, it could be acquired outside of this mechanism. Uh, it was developed by PAHOS member countries and within the key benefits of this mechanism, it includes that it could get to the country's lowest prices by consolidating the demand of the 41 countries that make part of it which is some kind of economies of scale, also uh, provides quality assured vaccines and also water related supplies by acquiring vaccines pre-qualified by WHO. Uh, also monitor the cold chain during all the delivery process and gives technical support in the selection of vaccines. So this has been a very important partner of Costa Rica and all the America's countries into achieving our goals for vaccination. Now, some achievements that we have achieved in Costa Rica in vaccine preventable diseases, uh, I would like to uh, start by smallpox eradication, which took place in the 70s officially, but actually the last case reported was way before. 
also polio eradication is something that we are now certificating. Uh, we are close to eradicate rubella and measles. However, measles we have had some imported cases, mainly from tourists visiting from Europe and other developed countries uh, that have no from people that have not been vaccinated. Uh, we have a significant decrease in Haemophilus influenza B related disease. And I know this vaccine is mainly against meningitis, but uh, as me, I have over 20 years of being a medical doctor and I have never seen a case of epiglottitis, for instance, uh, because, which was a re re relatively common cause of consultation before the vaccination. Uh, we also have had a significant decrease in varicella cases, not that much in varicella cases, but in varicella complication related cases. And also a decrease in community acquired pneumonia, both in children and in older adults. And that's attributable to the pneumococcal vaccination. And we have no reported congenital rubella cases in many years in Costa Rica. So that's also an important achievement that we have been able to oh, uh, throughout our immunization program. Uh, well, it's been a pleasure for me to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, if anybody has some comments, uh, I'll give you also my personal email. Someone wants to reach out and, and uh, elaborate some more on this subject. Thank you. Thanks uh, so much, uh, Dr. Pedro. Uh, that was uh, a very interesting set of insights, and I particularly enjoyed the fact that you put the success as your conclusion, your successes and the impact you're actually having, because I think often we focus on where we're going without uh, without doing that. Uh, we might begin with a few questions, and Marta, if it's all right with you, perhaps I'll start with the question uh, for Dr. Pedro. Um, because it'd be interesting to hear you elaborate about the revolving fund that we hear about uh, from Costa Rica. And uh, you touched on how you work with PAHO, but I think perhaps if you could just elaborate on that a, uh, a bit, it would be appreciated. Okay, uh, the revolving fund is uh, coordinated by PAHO. It's actually a part of PAHO. And... It is the what they do is to consolidate all the needs from the whole from the countries. They have four tracks and this by quarter 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 of years, uh, and they ask for the countries to uh, estimate the needs for each one of these quarters, and of, of which vaccines are going to be acquired by the fund. And as I told you before, in Costa Rica and in some other countries also, the law demands that the vaccine should be acquired by that fund, uh, which gives some strength to that fund also. Uh, we get very, very low prices compared to what we pay if we, we would pay if we don't acquire them by, by, by that fund. Uh, in fact, we have never been in that case that a vaccine is cheaper in the market than that, uh, the fund. Uh, sometimes, there are, there are vaccines that are not included in that fund. That depends also on negotiation between the fund and the providers. Um, and as many vaccines now have multiple origins, uh, sometimes there are some questions or some, uh, mainly some concerns about the quality of those vaccines that would be acquiring. And something that gives some tranquility to mainly to the general public, and it's an assurance for us is the fact that the vaccines acquired are acquired from laboratories that have been pre-qualified by WHO. So they have undergo a full process of surveillance. Uh, and we have, at this time, we haven't had any uh, experience or any experience, negative experience or, or, or on quality of of a vaccine procured by, by the fund. It's not perfect. Uh, sometimes it has some bureaucratic uh, issues and it's harder when we, you have to put together 41 countries 
uh, acquiring different vaccines, having different schemes from vaccination. And sometimes there are some countries that are, are more responsible and acquire what they committed to. Others are not that responsible. And sometimes also there are some problems out of the control of the fund from the providers. And sometimes a provider wouldn't deliver on time or on the expected moment. But also the fund has a gives us a help in that case because they are the ones contracting and it's harder for the provider to on, 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 not uh, not deliver to the fund the not delivering to a particular country. So if, if they get wrong with the fund, if they don't comply with an obligation with the fund, uh, they will get a more severe punishment and also would be banned possibly from providing the fund for us so, some years. Uh, and that's a very important incentive to, to provide a, a, on time. Uh, as I told, uh, some vaccines are not in the fund, so we have to procure them by the country. HPV vaccine is an example of one of those that uh, now, now I think they, they are going to have one of, of the vaccines, but, but wasn't available at least some years ago on, on the fund. Uh, but they are also always moving and, and negotiating with providers too. Uh, I don't yeah, know thanks. if I was... Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, we do have a couple of questions um, that I think perhaps I should just put to you before Martin moves to Anna Radner. Um, and the questions are about what are the coverage of HPV in Costa a vaccine in Costa Rica? And uh, similarly, what's the coverage for pneumococcal? Okay, HPV vaccination HPV, yeah. was a both doses was about BPH was about 60%. Uh, it's low. Uh, when we first started, it was in 1990, sorry, 2019, and then we have the pandemic. So we got a very good coverage at school level. Uh, it was almost 90% from, from the first doses, but then the schools closed it for one and a half years, something like that, for the pandemic, and that has in, in, incited on that uh, coverage. Now we are having some hesitations at some level from parents on, on vaccines. And that's also had been a, 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 a little hard to, to recover that, that level of vaccination. And in normal cell uh, for children, we have a coverage around 90%, 80 something percent uh, in general with, with full vaccination scheme. Thank you very much, Hugo. Very interesting uh, overview of the successful system you have in Costa Rica. My next question goes to Anurada and going back to HPV vaccination. Uh, as you know, the World Federation of Public Health Association is advocating for gender neutral vaccination, so vaccinating both girls and boys uh, around the world. Of course, there are a lot of concerns and limitations. Uh, but we advocate for that not only to prevent the disease of the different type of cancer related to HPV, but also to prevent the transmission. So what is your opinion about that and which strategies you suggest to develop in the different contexts and income of the countries? Yeah, so thank you, Marta, for that excellent question. Uh, actually, on gender neutral vaccination, uh, WHO uh, guidance based on a SAGE recommendation is very clear that um, gender neutral vaccination uh, is important. So SAGE has uh, recommended a vaccination of both boys and girls. And, uh, but, and therefore we have more than 50 countries now that, that uh, are doing gender neutral vaccination, right? Which, which covers both boys and girls. However, you are also aware that uh, in the past few years, there was a very big, uh, shortage of uh, vaccines and and therefore uh, when this uh, gender neutral vaccination was recommended by sage uh, that was the time when a lot of lower and middle income countries were preparing to introduce uh, hpv vaccine uh, for girls but because the demand outstripped supply of vaccine therefore uh, when some of the countries started to vaccinate boys as well, that resulted 
in, in lack of uh, ability on the part of institutions like Gavi to supply uh, uh, vaccine uh, for, for, for girls vaccination. And that is why uh, SAGE uh, and then WHO made a very strong recommendation that till such time as there is a supply constraint uh, of, of HPV vaccines, um, girls should actually be prioritized. So, and but once uh, the uh, uh, supply uh, starts to improve, then of course the longer term strategy is to vaccinate both boys and girls. Also in terms of age range, right? Now you, you know that now the recommendation is that if if a, a sort of women miss it or girls, young girls miss it, the, the ideal time is nine to 14 years of age. But if they miss it, they can actually receive HPV vaccine vaccine much after that, right? And on the recommendation of a service provider, you know, even in, in the later you know, sort of uh, eight years of uh, a woman's life. But all that, I think, uh, is difficult to implement because that requires very large amounts of, of uh, HPV vaccine, which has been a challenge uh, so far. But now we have new vaccine manufacturers uh, entering the market, and and therefore uh, the the uh, the uh, sort of the roadmap that has been prepared or projected by WHO on HPV vaccine market uh, situation is showing that in the year twenty twenty five uh, the supply constraint should be behind us. Thank you very much, Anurada. And remaining on strategies, we have a question from uh, uh, participants. What novel strategies can be employed in the context of HPV to maximize the impact of sustainable investments and achieve widespread behavior change across the globe? So uh, that's again a very important uh, uh, question. Uh, so as Hugo just said, one of the biggest challenges that we are seeing with HPV vaccine is uh, this hesitance, uh, hesitancy on the part of uh, parents. And in many countries, the experiences that when HPV vaccine is launched, uh, primarily uh, based on uh, sort of a, a school-centered uh, uh, campaign strategy, uh, actually, the introduction uh, or the coverage is very good, right? So we, we see very successful introductions in, in most of the countries. However, sustaining demand for HPV vaccine has proven to be much more uh, challenging. And as Hugo was uh, referring to, the uh, to, you know, uh, parents seem to be becoming very hesitant uh, to, to vac get their you know, girls vaccinated because there is a mistaken belief or perception that HPV vaccine is encouraging uh, their young girls towards promiscuity. So in my view, the first and the foremost challenge on behavior change is to actually link uh, HPV vaccine or benefits of HPV vaccine with cervical cancer elimination. Uh, the messaging so far has been over-focused on, on the fact that this, this, this disease is sexually transmitted. And you know, so the attempt has been to situate HPV vaccine within the sexual reproductive health. But I think if, if uh, uh, the, our message is uh, very simple and straightforward that HPV vaccine can actually prevent uh, cervical cancer and cervical cancer incidence is increasing among young women and actually claiming lives of uh, um, uh, women. I think that's a much more compelling message. And why I'm saying this is because we have seen that in some countries where, you know, the uh, societies are very orthodox or conservative, uh, there have been very high rates of HPV vaccination, sustained, sustained rates of uh, um, uh, vaccination because of this messaging. So in, for example, Saudi Arabia, UAE, you know, are some of those countries where they have kept their messaging very simple, you know, to, to uh, uh, send this message uh, that uh, HPV leads to cervical cancer and this vaccine is highly effective in preventing uh, that cancer. So, so I think one is this whole issue about messaging. And, and and making it simple and straightforward so that unnecessary 
uh, perceptions that we are witnessing, you know, not just in lower and middle income countries, but also in high income countries, including country like US, there, there was a longitudinal study that was recently done, which also showed that parents in the US are becoming increasingly hesitant uh, towards HPV vaccine. So I think it's a challenge that is omnipresent and we need to deal with that. The second, I think, is the issue of making sure that we maximize returns on, on, on investment, particularly because now uh, resources are highly constrained. You know, we know fiscal space is shrinking in all countries and all countries are sort of, you know, struggling with their health budgets and want to make the most of it. So I think one opportunity that, that is now available is with this new recommendation around single dose of HPV vaccine, because two doses of uh, HPV vaccine, first of all, are expensive. So if, if countries are resorting to a single dose uh, regimen, then clearly you half your cost you know, of, of the vaccine. And this becomes very important in case of those uh, countries who have to self-finance this vaccine, like Costa Rica, for example, right? Or, or, or other countries which don't have institutions like Gavi supporting them or supplying them the vaccine. But, but really the money or the funding for, for this vaccine has to come from their own domestic budgets. So I think one is that. But second, I think is also uh, implementation ease and feasibility. Because as Hugo was saying, that the first dose coverage was high, but the second dose, because if schools get closed, right, schools got closed during the pandemic. So follow up with second dose really became very tough in many countries. So I think if, if you don't have to follow up and then one dose is sufficient, then clearly it is also programmatically, uh, you know, more sustainable and uh, being easier to 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 sustain that and the last thing i would say is really this whole a uh, notion of integration and integrated service delivery so i i i really do maintain that in in uh, public health because of uh, the the way in which programs operate in silos you know, there are a lot of inefficiencies and waste. So increasingly, if we can support countries in, in designing integrated service delivery models where a bundle of services, you know, is, is delivered at the same time and we are actually finding synergies um, across programs, then the cost of delivering the services can, can come down. So when we are talking about a school-based HPV vaccination program, if through uh, that school-based program, other services are also provided for children and adolescents, clearly it is more cost efficient and therefore more sustainable. That uh, helps me lead into the next question that I'll put to uh, Hugo. I am conscious of uh, Dr. Miko Zulu's question from Zambia, and we'll come to that in a little while. Um, but I noted that on your um, National Vaccine and Epidemiology Commission that you have a paediatrician. Um, but these days we're starting to think much more of all of life and life course uh, immunisation. Uh, so uh, I've got two questions for you. One is, is there any discussion about putting a geriatrician? Because after all, it's older people that uh, vaccine uh, vaccines are helping uh, as as much as younger people. Uh, and secondly, when uh, you just touched on hesitancy, and I wonder uh, what the situation is with hesitancy in uh, Costa Rica, where you have such a good widespread uh, program. Okay. Uh, first of all, we have been, been discussing about the geriatrician, but we have had close working with geriatricians, and we have also an, an insectologist in the commission, so th th that could cover it. And we have something from the pharmacotherapy department, which also covers a little from, from that. Uh, but it would be interesting. I, 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 that's, that's an input that, that, that could be interesting now that we have this shift in population and we are having more, uh, each time, older and older people. It would be something to, to consider. And about vaccine hesitancy, we have had that problem from some years ago, but it escalated very badly during the COVID pandemic. Um, I think some groups uh, that didn't found that all that resonancy before, 
during the pandemic uh, found so, so some more places to reply the, their message and now we have a little more concern on that uh, I, I have not numbers yet but speaking with some colleagues uh, they say that some of the parents are now less hesitant are returning to a trust in the vaccine system they remain hesitant mainly to COVID vaccines uh, in children. There is some some problem with that. And also, and that was a problem uh, prior to the pandemic, some communities with a lot of uh, foreigner people and not from lo lo lower income countries, no, from developed countries, mainly from the United States, Canada, and Europe, have formed some kind of ghettos of communities where they live naturalistic and they don't believe in vaccines. And uh, we have had the two cases of measles that we have had in prior years were reported in those communities. Actually, one case was a French tourist, all the kids were not vaccinated and they came with measles in the flight. Fortunately, there was no uh, co contamination from anybody else in the airplane. And the community had a relatively high uh, vaccination rate, we were over 90%. So there were no secondary cases. Uh, we have had some uh, reinforcement, uh, some booster doses uh, and in, in the country. Every five to 10 years, we have a campaign for booster doses, mainly in measles and sometimes middle rubella vaccines. Uh, and I think that has helped on, on, on that. But uh, we are actually having so I told you some more, maybe more diffusion for the hesitant and anti-vaxxing movement now, mainly after the, the pandemic. Yeah, thanks, Hugo. It is an international challenge. Over to you, Marta. Thank you, Michael. I just want to pick now the question from uh, Dr. Zulu from Zambia that is addressed, I guess, to both speakers. Um, is, is, do you know if there is any plan to build capacity for local vaccine manufacture, especially if countries have the raw materials for those vaccines instead of depending on other countries? So is there a way to be more uh, independent from external aid and to build uh, research and development and production within the countries? Anurada. Yeah, so I, I think this is absolutely the direction uh, to follow. Uh, and uh, as uh, you are aware, uh, this has been a topic of hot uh, debate, right? This particularly this whole distributed vaccine manufacturing uh, capabilities, because during COVID-19 pandemic, it became very clear that there were certain countries that, that actually monopolized uh, vaccine production. And as a result, Africa, which, which is uh, one continent with literally no vaccine manufacturing um, uh, happening within the continent, uh, got pushed to the end of the queue and did not receive COVID-19 vaccines. I think that was a wake up call for everybody, uh, the global community, as well as for the continent. And, and everybody started to appreciate the fact that we need to have much more distributed vaccine manufacturing uh, in order to make sure that we also enhance uh, our global uh, preparedness for pandemics, right? And, and, and also enhance sustainability. So absolutely, that is the direction to take. And that is why we are seeing this big vaccine manufacturing initiative um, uh, in Africa, where there is a big push uh, to make sure that, that um, uh, Africa gets the requisite know-how, technology, and facilities uh, to start manufacturing vaccines for, for its own consumption. Uh, we know that um, Africa's uh, population is growing uh, and, and you know, it's, it's, uh, they are going to have a substantial uh, uh, population likely to double from, from this level by 2050. So clearly they, they need to be, uh, they need to take care of their own, own needs. That said, I think they, they, there are certain things to be kept in view. One is that um, uh, in, in vaccine production, you do need economies of scale. 
So you can't, every country cannot have its own manufacturing uh, capability uh, because then uh, you need certain minimum volumes and, and you need to reap the benefit of economies of scale. So while regional uh, vaccine manufacturing is a good uh, concept and idea to pursue, it cannot be country by country uh, vaccine manufacturing because we have also seen in the past then vac that vaccine needs in some ways are quite inelastic. So once you uh, vaccinate your 100% target population, the demand is quite, uh, the demand is inelastic. It is not elastic. So you can't start to give people more vaccines. Right, so it, it so you can't just go beyond that 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 the uh, the the limit that you actually need to vaccinate hundred percent of your population with the number of doses that are recommended. Right, so so therefore we have seen it in uh, with, with certain other vaccines in the past, like yellow fever, that when you have many more vaccine manufacturers entering the market, and you have uh, production which is which far exceeds. The, the, the demand, then there is a shakeout in the market. And, and you know, vaccine manufacturers shut down uh, their, their plants and, and go away. And, and then it leads to a crisis of sorts, like it happened with ye yellow fever, where there was a glut and then there was an exit of a vaccine manufacturer from the market and suddenly you, we, ha we have a shortage, even now we have a shortage, right, on yellow fever. So so I think we, so with vaccine manufacturing, th those are the kind of things that, that have to be kept in mind. So far as research and development is concerned, absolutely, this has to be country-based as much as possible because we now understand that epidemiology actually is very, very unique and different country by country. So if you, if, you know, so uh, uh, products that are, that are uh, sort of, that are being developed in certain parts of the world based on certain genotypes and certain population characteristics may not actually work for certain uh, other populations in other countries and continents. And I think we, we really need to invest in, in research um, uh, capabilities uh, in as many countries as, as, as possible. I wonder Thank if you. I can take, I wonder if I can take you in a slightly different direction. Uh, we've uh, heard from Hugo about the success of Costa Rica and how they uh, do it. Uh, your experience, Anurada, is, uh, is just so broad. Are there key recommendations you would make to other countries uh, and other health professionals about how to improve our uh, coverage, or our vaccine uh, coverage. Uh, what are the key elements to success is really my question. Yeah. Can I start with you, so, Hugo, first and then go to Anurata? So I think what has happened in the past is that uh, we all were all driven by a notion that if vaccines are safe and effective and they help fight diseases, once once they are developed and they are supplied to countries, communities will come forward and take those vaccines because they are beneficial, right? And this is what was happening, right? New, new vaccines were being developed and as they were introduced in countries, 70%, 80% of the population you know, came forward to receive those vaccines. But I think, Michael, the big change that we are now seeing is that one, there is multiplicity of vaccines. So you, we, you have more and more vaccines coming to the market, you know, for, for a number of uh, disease, new diseases. And, and therefore, uh, the number that now is recommended by WHO and will be recommended in future. As we speak, we know that Gavi is finalizing it, its vaccine investment strategy. And therefore, they, there might be a new suite of vaccines that, that will be supported. So you are looking at chikungunya, and dengue and RSV and GBS and, you know, malaria is already out there and so many other vaccines. So I think what, uh, with, with health, health systems that haven't actually received any new injection of resources in the past, past few years, but actually have been depleted further uh, during the pandemic, it is becoming increasingly hard for the same EPI uh, 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 to, to actually uh, take, take responsibility for more and more 
uh, vaccines. And, and this is those countries like which are supported by Gavi, where they don't have to pay for vaccines, right? The ma majority of the cost is picked by Gavi, but the delivery has to be done by those systems, right? Which are already under a lot of uh, strain. So I think that's just one reality that, that we have to keep in mind the multiplicity and 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 then what does it mean for communities right and and how does the country exercises choices right uh, to to actually adopt some newer vaccines or not but the second is how do communities exercise their options to to embrace those vaccines which are already which are offered by the government so the second i think issue that i want to touch on is this whole lack of attention to, to the social and behavioral uh, aspects of, of uh, vaccine demand. So, so, so I, I always say that vaccination happens when three Vs come together. One is the vaccine, the second is the vaccinator, and the third is the vaccinee. So, so though we have challenges, right, with vaccine supply and vaccinator, assuming they are all met, right, I think the, the third V, which is the vaccinee, which is really the recipient of the vaccine, I think that particular aspect has not received full attention because we have sort of assumed that vaccine demand is there. But I think based on what uh, Hugo was saying, you know, we do see communities, right? We uh, And they can be ethnic minorities, they can be religious minorities, they can be nomadic populations, they can be mobile migrant groups, they can be refugees, you know, who have settled into a new country, ha have, been, uh, have been rendered homeless, they, they are internally displaced people. There are people who are sort of uh, uh, living in very remote, hard, hard to reach, inaccessible areas where services don't reach. So there are all kinds of uh, groups that actually are not benefiting from the power of vaccines and other essential health services. And I think it is high time that we started to first dig deep into this equity puzzle to actually understand where in, in a big uh, sort of landscape, some communities are being left behind. And you will recall that when I was at Gavi, I actually created this concept of zero dose children uh, because I was driven by that motivation to actually shine spotlight on those children who were not receiving even a single, single, single dose of the most basic DTP vaccine. And when I brought forward that concept and I studied to uh, and started to study the phenomenon of zero dose children, I realized that two thirds of those zero dose children actually live in households that subsist on less than $1.90 per day, which is the international definition for extreme poverty. So these are extremely poor groups. And the second thing that we found I found was that they also live in households where their mothers have uh, have uh, uh, do not have access to skilled birth attendance, antenatal care, contraception. These households don't have access to sanitation, water, nutrition. Children are not not normally in schools. So these households actually represent multiple deprivations and compounded vulnerability. So I really think we we they deserve uh, our attention. But then there are groups, as Dr. Hugo was referring to, who actually may have the means, right? May have the means to access services, but may be driven. By by certain intrinsic beliefs and perceptions and attitudes, you know, to, to for example, not take measles vaccine. And we see that in the US also, you know. And, and I think that is why investing in social and behavioral research to understand, you know, why that resistance is there, you know, uh, is, is going to be very important because that's an underappreciated and neglected uh, area. I think that the key is that that, that last uh, words from Dr. Gupta. So what are the key driver of this hesitation in some populations in order to go with them with the right messages? Because it's not the same cases, not even in a small country like Costa Rica, hesitancy has different drivers at, at different levels. And we need to understand the hesitancy in order to to go out with a straight message, an adequate message, and, and to meet that need from the from the population, uh, I think also at international level we should united forces uh, in order to to achieve that because 
some of those groups are taken into advantage of social media and they are disseminating false information from all over the world and they are affecting the many countries on that but that's only a part of that it's not, 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 not the only cause not the main cause but it's something that should be addressed in, in, in that, that moment adequately and i also think a key a driver to get a successful immunization program is also to go to the community. You, you need to get to the community the vaccine, school level, other community services, but you have to get to the community with the vaccines uh, so that people take advantage of them. And, and I think also it's very important to keep a message on the positive things of elements of vaccines and how they are helping us to eradicate diseases. As I told before, uh, sometimes the immunization programs are victims of, of their success. And uh, when you don't, haven't seen a, a measles case in years, or you haven't seen polymyelitis, you have, you, I haven't had any any pair from me uh, dead from polio as uh, my parents did. So uh, they, 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 they have suffered the direct consequences of a vaccine preventable disease. And they have seen how it's not an issue anymore. So it's easier to convince them, those groups of people. Um, yeah, we call uh, that we call that the public health paradox. Uh, yes, we? The more exactly, successful exactly. we are in public health, the less people think we're needed. And exactly, uh, exactly. yeah. Thank you uh, so much for those uh, for those insights, Marta. Thank you, Michael. A couple of more questions from the audience. Um, the first one is about research. Um, and it's for Anurada. Uh, are you aware of international studies or models for that to establish any difference in cost effectiveness between different HPV vaccines? Yeah, so we have, we don't have, in fact, you know, uh, from the consortium side, we have been looking at um, the evidence gaps. And, and um, what we have realized is that on cost effectiveness, well, they, 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 there is more evidence that needs to be generated. Mm -hmm. So I think even in terms of, uh, you know, how uh, sort of uh, even sort of com comparison, uh, how what is it that we are investing and what is the rate of return? So we understand for vaccines as a whole. For example, we always say that $1 invested in uh, vaccines actually will fetch a return of $52, $54 actually in the case of LMICs in uh, broader social and economic gains, but we don't have that antigen by antigen breakdown uh, and not for HPV, right? So I think return on investment, we, we need to understand that better. But second, I think the question that you are, or the, uh, or, uh, the audience is asking is between products, right? So this is what I understand, Marta, the question is, so if we have a two valent uh, uh, HPV product or four valent or nine valent, then what is the, what are the cost effects? So that does not exist today. And, and some of the studies that have happened actually have recommended in the past, I, I know that they, there are these studies which had actually compared uh, two valent HPV vaccine with four valent and actually come up with this conclusion that both are equally effective. And based on the premise that uh, it is a, a strain 16 and 18, which are uh, predominant in countries, and therefore two valent actually you know, has the same kind of effectiveness. But that may not hold true in the long run, because as you continue with vaccination, then there, there, there may be strain replacement, you know, and, and therefore I think this is really a moving target. That, and, and it is important that uh, at the global level, uh, more in, or continued investments are made in, 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 in collecting this evidence. Um, I'd like to uh, put a, a general question. I will just address the question we've got about One Health Governance, and I think you can uh, see that. So the concept of uh, One Health covering uh, everything, I think, is uh, is important. In some ways, I think you've both addressed it, but if in answering your other questions, if you can address that as well, it would be, it would be good. Uh, my question actually goes back to success in... Uh, in vaccination. So smallpox we've got rid of. Uh, last year, there were 12 cases uh, of polio, wild, wild polio virus. 
um, altogether, you know, compared to a few years ago in the 80s when it was 350,000 a year. So we've got this huge success going on. Do we think we're going to have a similar success with uh, HPV? Uh, and Aradna, I know you've painted that picture. Um, in my own country, in Australia, we're predicting no more cervical cancer from 2035. Um, it's an amazing thing. What would be your prediction for Costa Rica, Hugo? What would be your prediction, uh, uh, and Aradna, for the world? Can we do it? When should we be able to do it by? Yeah, well, so well, I think this is a very uh, difficult question to answer, Michael, but uh, it is possible, right? It is possible. So Australia has this ambition, as you rightly said. In fact, uh, interestingly, even Indonesia, even Indonesia has committed uh, to eliminating cervical cancer, which really means that they will have to um, attain and sustain a very high level of vaccination coverage besides, you know, ensuring access to screening and, and treatment, right? So so that's that's uh, because it's a three-pronged approach. So I think, but I think it's good to see countries becoming more and more ambitious. So as we speak today only, I saw a study coming out of UK, Michael. So you might have seen it. It's today only, right? That, that I saw this saying that in Scotland, they found that they haven't found even a single case of cervical cancer since uh, because of the vaccination rates that they have been able to achieve. So these are, these are very striking examples. So I think if more and more countries are able to really achieve uh, just, just a very high level of vaccination and, and are able to demonstrate that by, by a vaccination by itself means actually no cervical cancer cases, I'm sure there is going to be a lot more traction on the part of countries to, to uh, try and invest higher efforts in, in um, you know, not just introducing HPV vaccine, but also ensuring high coverage. And, and that is why I come back to the point that I was making. We have to make a link between HPV and cervical cancer. So messaging is very important. You are muted, Michael. Yeah, Hugo. And your other answer, Hugo, with regard to, uh, because you've described uh, Costa Rica's health system, One Health, uh, that, uh, you know, that covers uh, education, environment, uh, everything. Actually, we are working now on that concept. Um, we are trying to involve also animal health, which is very important, like environmental health. Also in the approach of uh, anti-microbial resistance, uh, there is very important because they use in agriculture and the use in uh, of many of these uh, antibiotics is very important for us too. Uh, so also it's important to get to uh, programs, uh, in integral programs, uh, which comprise all the the determinants of health. Not 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 only the direct care. So it's a very important approach. Uh, and it's something in which uh, now in the Ministry of Health of, of Costa Rica, so it's taking some leadership uh, uh, onto that matter. And we hope to, to see more on that in the future. Thank you very much. I'm conscious of time and getting closer to the end of the webinar, I would like to invite our speaker to make one closing take home message. So going back to the main focus of the webinar, sustainable investment in immunization, which would be your main message or few key advices you want to give to our audience today? Anna Guta, please. Yeah, so uh, I, I will repeat my message to say that immunization is one of the most uh, cost effective uh, public health interventions. As Michael also said, we, we, it, uh, a vaccine was able to eradicate uh, smallpox. We, we, are, we have seen a, a dramatic reduction in, the, in, in, in polio cases. We are hopeful that polio will also be eradicated in near future. Measles elimination, America showed, is, is very much possible. So all those diseases that have killed uh, people in large numbers can be very easily tackled through immunization and, and, and vaccines. And, and therefore, I think this is this is the this is one area where countries need to invest. 
However, we are we have entered an era where the availability of products is is uh, is not sufficient by itself, and increasingly we have to pay attention to understanding uh, vaccine acceptance and demand you know, patterns. Uh, on the part of communities and really invest in social and behavioral research and target and tailor uh, our interventions uh, to the specific needs of countries and communities, appreciating that one size does not fit any longer and, and countries are heterogeneous, so are communities and, and we, we really have to um, uh, respond to this whole challenge of heterogeneity and uh, be much more uh, innovative and creative in that regard. Thank you very much. So communication, targeted communication and very specific behavioral studies to make sure we make a change in the community perception of immunization. Hugo, what is your closing message? I think it's hard uh, to amplify further uh, how uh, 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 Dr. Gupta had said. But it's very important for for the the countries, for the population of the world, to have regional level uh, investigation and development, mainly for smaller countries, smaller economies, and we need also to a uh, group that need for vaccine fabrication, and it's very important to keep developing new vaccines, but also to ensure that the adequate procurance of those vaccines that, that, that are essential now. We, we need to continue with our vaccination schemes with those uh, successful vaccines. We need to, to, to keep having them as we develop newer vaccines and vaccines for new diseases, for the diseases that haven't had yet. And we also need to invest not only in the development of the vaccines, but also very important in understanding the needs of communication from the population. Very, very, very important uh, to tackle the vaccine, he vaccine hesitancy. hesitancy. It's not, not necessarily a problem to have someone with questions about the vaccines. It's, it's important, but, but it's important to eradicate misconceptions uh, that, 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 that very easily spread in population. I think that that, that would be the, the key message. You know, Marta, when I listen uh, to these summaries, uh, something interesting goes through my mind, and it was in my time as a health minister some years ago uh, when people would say, look, if we have more vaccine, and I had just completed my master's in public health before I became a health minister, and I understood that if we uh, uh, invested in public health, we invested in uh, a vaccination, that, uh, that my biggest cost element could probably be reduced and the biggest cost in any health system is the hospitals but they didn't get reduced and so I went well is there a return on investment but of course what happened was the hospitals were there freed up to do other things and we saw this particularly around COVID when hospitals were overwhelmed by uh, people sick with uh, with uh, COVID and the result was that lots of other operations that helped make people healthier, that helped them return to the workforce in a productive manner was undermined. So the message is still very, very clear that uh, vaccinations, the return on investment is very, very positive uh, and goes, and but it's not just, it's going to reduce um, use of hospitals. It just changes the use of uh, of uh, hospitals so the return on investment as we've heard in many uh, situations is uh, is really very 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 clear uh, and thank you all for being here and thank you to the to the participants Marta your final word thank you Michael just few words to say thank you very much to each of you that have been with us for almost one hour and a half. It has been really inspiring to hear your uh, experience, to learn more about the concrete cases, about what happened in the countries now and what we plan to have in few years. And the 
For example, the planning of eradicating cervical cancer in so many countries is a dream that is not so distant. And this, with this hope, let's say, uh, in our mind, I would like to close this, uh, this webinar and to thank uh, uh, all that supported the, the different activities of the International Immunization po uh, Policy Task Force related to this specific project and more specifically Pfizer and the University of Geneva and my co-chair Michael and of course the two amazing speakers Anoda and Hugo for being with us and I wish you all based in Europe a good night and for the rest of the world, a good day or a good end of the day. Uh, thank you so much, Mata and Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you.